Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's lesson in current events class. It is lesson number two in our unit on immigration, and today we are going to discuss the topic of push factors. And so your guiding question for the day um, and I will tell you this in class, you're either going to write this across the top of your notes or on the left side, is um, what are some examples of push factors? Uh, and just to let you know, today we are going to look at this through the lens of four different countries or regions of the world where people are leaving. Um, we like to say that they are emigrating, and that starts with an E, E-M-I-G-R-A-T-I-N-G, -I that if you're emigrating, it means you are leaving someplace. So today, we're going to look at some of the reasons why people leave. So let's go ahead and get started with that. So the first country we're going to look at is the country that is closest to us in terms of uh, an immigration issue. Um, what pushes people out of Mexico? Let's make that a left side question. So your original question should have been at the top of your notes. This question will be on the left. What pushes people out of Mexico? First thing we need to know is that Mexico has a lot of crime uh, and a lot of that crime is related to the drug cartels. Uh, the drug cartels are organized uh, groups of criminals who basically ship drugs across the border illegally into the United States and that makes the cartels a great deal of money. Um, and this has been glamorized by uh, shows like Narcos, although that's referring to Colombia, not Mexico, but it uh, still kind of shows what that's like. Um, don't watch that show without your parents' permission. Um, drug cartels are responsible for a lot of the crime and killings which make people feel unsafe in Mexico. Uh, in Mexico, people simply disappear. Um, if they say anything negative about the drug cartels or they get in the way of the drug cartels, people just tend to disappear. Um, and that can tend to make one feel unsafe. Uh, their bodies end up dumped in the streets. Sometimes they are... Uh, disposed of in ways I'm not going to describe here, um, but the point is if you live in areas that have a lot of activity with the cartels, um, unless you're on the cartel's good side, um, safety is definitely an issue. Um, police officers who actually have integrity and actually fight the cartels and do their job also end up disappearing or dead. So police officers have a choice to maintain their integrity, fight the cartels and risk their lives, or accept bribes from the cartels and basically work for the cartels. Same thing with journalists. Journalists who look into what the cartels are doing uh, tend to disappear or end up dead. Uh, and journalists who look the other way and ignore the cartels um, generally are allowed to keep their lives. And again, we're talking about areas that are uh, strongly influenced by the cartels. Depending on what part of Mexico you're living in, uh, it can be different. So the government of Mexico historically is very corrupt, uh, especially on the local level. If you're talking about your local police force, your municipal uh, police, the Policia Municipal, um, bribery is very, very common. Whereas if you're talking the federales, the federal police, the national government, um, there is corruption, but it's not quite as bad. Um, and uh, Mexico has just elected a new president and a new government with a new political party that is promising change. So we will see what happens there. Uh, that would be Antonio Manuel Lopez Obrador, also known as AMLO. Um, he's run for president. This is his third time, and he's finally won. So uh, we'll see what goes on there. So Mexico has issues with rural decline and urbanization. Um, conditions in the rural area are not very good at all, and people are moving to the cities in large numbers, especially Mexico City. Uh, Mexico City is the second largest city on the face of the earth. 
uh, second only to Tokyo, and large parts of Mexico City are basically slums. So uh, poverty is very high, and jobs are very hard to get, and those jobs that you get uh, don't tend to pay very well. And so the other issue in Mexico is education. Um, most people in Mexico struggle to get beyond the eighth grade level. So uh, educational opportunities are poor. Approximately 62% of Mexicans finish middle school and only about 45% finish high school. So when you have a population that isn't very well educated, um, the degree to which that population is going to get ahead is limited and money is a big issue in Mexico. If you're wealthy, you have the money to send your kids to high school and send your kids to college, whereas the actual national and state governments don't necessarily pay for that. And again, that depends on what part of Mexico you are actually living in. So let's go ahead and take a look at some pictures of Mexico here. Um, right here, this picture represents um, people who are rallying in support of their loved ones who've disappeared or been killed uh, by criminal gangs or drug cartels in Mexico. Often their way of showing their outrage is to march silently through the streets holding up pictures of their loved ones, and that's a very, very real thing. Uh, this picture down here represents rural decline in Mexico. A lot of the rural areas in Mexico are very, very poor um, and look similar to what you see in this picture. Uh, this picture up here represents different parts of Mexico and what um, drug cartels actually have control or influence in those areas. Um, of course, that changes with time. Uh, this one I believe is as of April of 2015, so it's a few years old. But uh, you know, the drug cartels are always, um, you know, struggling over territory. Um, but whatever part of Mexico you're in, you have to deal with the cartel that's there. And then uh, this picture down here represents police who are corrupt and um, work with the drug cartels rather than for the government that's fighting the drug cartels. And not all police in Mexico are corrupt. There are very um, decent police officers who do their job and try and have integrity, but they're not paid very well and they're risking their lives um, because the cartels in many cases are as powerful or in some cases more powerful than the government itself. And all of these represent reasons why people in Mexico might want to leave and um, find a better life for themselves by immigrating. And we're going to switch over to the next country. So the next country we're going to look at is Syria. Um, Syria is in the Middle East. It is east of Israel, north and east of Jordan. It is west of Iraq, and it is south of Turkey. And Syria has been having some serious issues since 2011. So our left side question is what pushes people out of Syria? So Syria was once a stable country and it was once fairly wealthy. Uh, stable meaning, you know, did not have a civil war. Wealthy meaning, you know, people did okay there. Um, it was a dictatorship, but it was stable. Um, it has had a civil war going on since 2011. And a civil war is a war fought between people living inside the same country. So basically, the people of Syria rose up to fight against the government of Syria. So the people of Syria rose up against their government, and the government fought back by bombing and killing its own citizens so it could remain in power. Um, the government of Syria has used chemical weapons against its own people to try and maintain control. Um, it has also formed an alliance with Russia and Iran, uh, who have sent troops into Syria to help maintain uh, control over Syrian territory. So it started off as a civil war, but uh, outside powers have been invited in. Um, and the United States has been involved in Syria 
um, especially as it regards getting rid of ISIS, which is a completely different topic we can talk about in a different unit. But uh, ISIS was a major factor in Syria, factor being an academic vocabulary word. Um, cities in Syria were taken over by many different groups. So at first the rebels were very successful and they took over a lot of major cities in Syria, although different cities were taken over by different groups and sometimes those groups were working against each other instead of with each other. One of those groups was ISIS, which stands for the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. Um, and there were other extreme religious groups uh, involved in the Syrian civil war as well. Um, those groups that were less extreme and a little bit more friendly to democracy and to the United States uh, never actually did very well. Um, and by the time the Obama administration got around to thinking about helping them, um, it was almost too late. So many of these cities are bombed out and nearly destroyed. So if you're living in a city that's bombed out and nearly destroyed, chances are you're going to want to leave. And if you're going to want to leave, that makes you a refugee. You're not living because you want to. You're leaving because pretty much your city is destroyed and you have to leave or you risk being killed by the constant bombing that's taking place in these shelled out cities. So on the next slide, I'm going to show you what that looks like. Uh, it's not a pretty picture, um, but go ahead and finish these notes before I switch the slide. Yes, it became a miserable place to live. I suppose if your city is bombed out, you kind of assume that, but I went ahead and put that in your notes. So here we go. This represents what many of the cities in Syria looked like after the different groups were fighting over them and after the Syrian government fought back by bombing them. So imagine trying to live in that. And would you actually want to try and do that? There are two sides to that coin. If it's your hometown, if it's where you're born, if it's where your culture is, you might want to stay. But if it gets to the point where it's so miserable that it's not worth it, you might want to leave. Um, this represents ISIS, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. These are ISIS fighters. That's the ISIS flag. ISIS controlled a large portion of Syria um, as well as Iraq. Um, when they were at their height around 2014. And this right here is Bashar al-Assad. He is the president of Syria. Uh, you could call him the dictator of Syria. Uh, it is strongly believed that he is responsible for ordering chemical weapons attacks on his own people to maintain control. Uh, and so all of these things we're talking about here would be push factors, which would make people want to leave Syria. So let's go ahead and talk about Africa. Uh, in the case of Africa, we're not talking about a single country. We're talking about an entire area we call Sub-Saharan Africa, which is Africa south of the Sahara Desert. So if you've already had seventh grade social studies, uh, you learned quite a bit about those countries um, in seventh grade. If you're in seventh grade now, you're going to be learning about those countries. So our question is what pushes people out of Africa? So Africa struggles with high poverty. Uh, many countries in Africa have civil wars. Uh, many of the countries in Africa are politically unstable because they came into being after World War II. And the borders and boundaries of African countries don't make a lot of sense when you consider uh, the different tribes, re religious affiliations, and the history of the people who live there. So all of these things are pushing many Africans to consider leaving their countries. And depending on which country you're talking about, there are different reasons for that. Uh, just to cite Nigeria as an example, there is a rebel group that is affiliated with Islam called Boko Haram that is fighting against the government of Nigeria. And so about half the Nigerian population is Muslim. The other half of the Nigerian population is Christian and um those groups fight against each other oftentimes more than they work together, just as an example. Um, Nigeria, Ethiopia, another country that's had a civil war, Ghana and Kenya 
Uh, Kenya has had a lot of political instability. The presidential elections in Kenya are always very controversial. Um, all of these are countries where the most immigrants come from. Um, and I believe when I researched that fact, that's where most of the immigrants who are coming to the United States come from. Um, but the issue with African immigration is that a lot of that immigration goes towards Europe across the Mediterranean Sea. So this picture right here represents immigrants getting on boats and trying to get themselves into Europe illegally um, by crossing the Mediterranean Sea. So this graphic right here represents the large network of roads and smuggling routes that help get immigrants across the Sahara Desert into position to migrate. So just like there are coyotes that help immigrants get across the U.S. border, there's a whole network of people who help Africans get out of Africa. And that includes crossing the Sahara Desert, which is literally the largest desert on the face of the earth. This is not a pleasant journey. It's not an easy journey. And it's a journey that is oftentimes caused by desperation. So just like some of the other situations we have researched, uh, many Africans are refugees escaping from really not very pleasant situations. And I'm about to show you some pictures of all that. So this right here represents some of the violence, instability, and civil war that exists in some African countries. I realize that's a bit of a graphic image, but uh, I'm not putting it there to scare you. I'm putting it there to show you the danger that many Africans feel uh, living in their home countries. Um, this represents Africans um, crossing the Sahara Desert, and the flag you see in the background there is the flag of the European Union. A lot of Africans are trying to get into the European Union, and they literally crowd themselves onto boats like this uh, in the hopes of getting into Europe. And many of those boats capsize or tip over, um, leaving hundreds of Africans dead in the water just trying to escape. So that's how desperate they are to get out of their countries. And then the other issue I want to look at is Central America. You know, in America, we tend, or in the United States, I'll be more specific, we tend to focus on Mexico. But the truth of the matter is a lot of the people coming into the United States over the U.S.-Mexico border are not from Mexico. Many of them are from Central America, the countries that are south of Mexico. Guatemala, Belize, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and Panama. And of those, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras are where most of those immigrants are coming from. Some come from Nicaragua, but Costa Rica and Panama are relatively stable countries. So, uh, but the conditions in Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua are worse than the condition in El Salvador, are worse than the conditions in Mexico. So there are things that push people out of Central America. And one thing you need to understand is that compared to Mexico, these countries are very, very poor. Um, it is often said that Mexico is to Central America what the United States is to Mexico. So Mexico compared to the United States is a poor country and people want to move from Mexico to the United States. But for Guatemalans, El Salvadorans and Hondurans, they're the poor countries and Mexico is the rich country. So many Central Americans um, are just trying to get into Mexico. Um, their governments are weak, unstable, and they're often corrupt. So, you know, the government does not offer safety to the people in those countries. And in many cases, they view their governments as being the enemy or being their oppressor. And that um, is very, very challenging. And getting into Mexico to them is actually a better situation, even though the Mexican authorities are often very hostile towards immigrants who come across Mexico's southern border. In fact, right now, Mexico is cooperating with the United States to try and seal off its southern border because the government of Mexico sees that as being in its interest, and it also helps the United States and makes President Trump very happy. So um, most people aren't aware of that, but that's actually happening. So uh, gang activity and violence, especially in El Salvador, is rampant. Um, 
MS-13, the gang that is rather famous, uh, is based in El Salvador. Um, and even though it has tentacles that reach into Mexico and the United States, it started as part of the El Salvadoran Civil War uh, in the 1980s. So in, compared to Mexico in these countries, jobs are even fewer and the wages are even poorer. So even though compared to the United States, um, Mexico is a poor country compared to Central America, Mexico is a richer country. So people would like to try and get into Mexico from those countries because um, from their perspective, they can do better in Mexico than they can in their own country. So basically, and this is the case with every country we learned about, but if, if people feel unsafe in their countries, they're going to try to leave. If people feel like they can't get ahead in their own countries, they're going to try to leave. And I've only looked at four examples here. There's a lot more than just these four examples. But, but these are the factors, these are the forces that drive immigration globally. So again, I don't want you thinking of immigration just as a U.S.-Mexico issue. Uh, this is a global issue. Um, and if you can come out of this unit understanding that it's a global issue, then you're going to make Mr. Blumenthal very, very happy. Uh, at this point, we've reached the end of the lesson, and I would like you to write a summary at the bottom of your notes. I would like you to write one sentence about Mexico. I would like you to write one sentence about Syria. I would like you to write one sentence about Africa. And I would like you to write one sentence about immigration out of Central America. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Blumendahl, once again, signing off until next time on the Waldo Middle School Social Studies YouTube Network.